There's a few items I would like to address in these examples. And the first one will be revisiting the ways you can give SketchUp input. One, of course, is just visual input by clicking and getting input. The other is numeric input. And uh, you know what? I'll move over. I'll start drawing a rectangle. I don't think I've shown this with a rectangle, but I could type 10, 20, and hit enter. And that comma will tell me a, a height and a width. So, you know, I could look at that and see it's very small. I could type 100, 250, and hit enter. And as before, before I do anything else in terms of um, grabbing another tool or clicking anywhere in my screen, I can can continue to give numeric input. So there's 150 and 100. So, you know, there's the visual and the numeric input. But there's another one um, that we haven't talked about, and it's really called memory input. And I'm going to start a new file. And to show you these examples, what I will do is draw a square and a circle. And make sure it's a 24-sided circle. It'll be a little bit easier for a couple of uh, the mini examples I'll be showing. And I'm going to go ahead and orbit. You can either jump straight to your isometric view here or just orbit by pressing and dragging with the middle wheel button on your mouse. And I'll use my push-pull tool to click once to start. And I'll just try to eye it to make that pretty close to a cube. But uh, regardless of the way I've given SketchUp the input, it knows that that last push-pull was a very specific height. So a lot of these tools have this memory, and you can invoke that memory by double-clicking. So if I double-click on this surface here, it push-pulls that exact same amount. In a moment, I'm, I'm going to make a few comparisons between the push-pull tool right here and the move tool. Sometimes they can get confusing in terms of the effect that they have. Sometimes it's a little similar, sometimes it's completely different, but regardless, it's important that you know the difference. But let me just talk a little bit more about this memory. If I turn on my hidden geometry, I can see all the faces that make up this curved surface. And I am going to go ahead and push-pull one of those faces, just a little bit. And then if I double-click, of course, it repeats that last step. But I, I just want to make sure that when you double-click, it is a true double-click, a, a two clicks in succession. Because here's what I see a lot. People will be, okay, well, click, click. I double-clicked and nothing happened. Well, you did two slow single clicks. It has to be kind of quick. Um, the other thing is to not move your mouse when you do this. I see people sometimes do this. Click, click, and you can see it didn't really do what you expected because I moved my mouse as I clicked. Seems kind of trivial, but it is important that when you invoke this memory by double-clicking that your mouse doesn't move and you do, in fact, do a double-click. So go ahead and play around with that. And, you know, while I've got a curved surface here, I'd like to show one other thing that I believe I forgot to mention in another video. But you can you can encourage a snap to the center point, just like you can encourage different entrance points you can encourage a snap to the center of an arc or a circle. And you simply do that by hovering over the edge just for a second. And when you return your cursor, you'll see that it snaps. And at this point, I'm even encouraging some inference lines from that center. But, you know, that's kind of a, it's kind of a good thing to know. All right, another tool that has this... Um, this memory is the offset tool. Let's go ahead and click on that. Just like all of the tools, you can give it the three types of input, you know, visual, numeric, or the double-click memory. And this tool, pay attention to that little red dot that kind of follows your cursor around. That's the reference point, and here's what it means. So if I click once to start this push-pull, and if I look at my value control box, I can see the values of where my distance is, but that distance is measured from that reference point. So it's really important where that reference point is. So just like before, I can click to set this. That's visual input. I can type a number, so one foot or two feet, and hit enter. And uh, I can change that. Now, I'd like to just revisit this concept as well. When you give it its final numeric 
keyboard input. It's important that you don't do anything else. So if I type three feet or one feet or 20 centimeters, I can continue to do this until I grab another tool. And you know, in one of the very first examples, I showed you how you could do this with the line tool. Now, sometimes you can get away with simple things like orbiting. So if I orbit over here, and now I'll type uh, 2.4 feet and hit enter, I can see that it still changes. But if I were to click on another tool or hit escape on my keyboard and then type 2.4 feet or 2.5 feet, nothing happens. So keep in mind that the order is important for that last numeric input. And when we start getting into creating copies and arrays, I can't stress how important it is that you keep that order in mind and you really get used to using it with the different operations in SketchUp. What I'm going to do next is erase that those geometries of that inside square. And uh, I'll grab my offset tool again. And uh, I'll go ahead and click and uh, just offset that a little bit. And then I'll double click on this surface. Now you should be seeing that highlighted. That's indicating an active select method. So once you see that highlighted, double click. And I'm going to do it on the top as well. Double click. Then I'll grab the push pull tool and I will push pull this face out, just eyeing it here double click on this one, but don't double click on that top one because I'd like to grab the move tool now, which is this little red kind of cross icon over here. And we can see it active select as we can with most tools. And what I'd like you to do is click once on this surface and start to move your mouse. Now be very careful as you move it and notice how you can snap to the direction inference points or the inference directions, the blue, the red, and there's the green. And I've shown you before how once you are in one of those directions, you can hold down shift, press and hold on shift, and it locks it in that direction regardless of where the cursor is at. So that's a useful convention worth revisiting. Keep in mind that you can't infer an arbitrary direction or you can't snap in arbitrary direction. So this black is just telling me I'm kind of going off in some arbitrary direction. Holding down shift does nothing. Another interesting way you can control that is with your arrow keys on your keyboard. So if I press my left arrow key, the left arrow key locks it in the green direction. I'll press the left arrow key again to deactivate that. Now the right arrow key as you might imagine, locks that in the red direction. And the up or down, they do the same thing. They lock it in the blue direction. So very good to, to know how to lock your inference moving. And you, you can do that with the shift key or your arrow keys. Now I can either hit that same arrow key or hit escape just to boot myself out of that move. But this is why I wanted to show you this compared to the push pull tool. If I grab the move tool again, start moving this and I'll be very careful to move this in the green direction. Well, it looks very similar to when I'm doing a push pull. I'll go ahead and hit escape. And sometimes you don't have any choice. You know, that one you can move it kind of all over the place. But if you click on this top surface here and start moving, you'll find out that you're, you're locked to only the blue direction. And that's just because the way the geometries exist, that's really the only way you can move it anyway. So hit escape on the keyboard. Um, go ahead and still with the move tool, click on this top surface that you do not want moved or push pulled. So it's just a flat coplanar square on top of a larger square. And I'll click once to start moving. Now what's interesting is this surface is effectively glued to that plane. You can move it off of that plane but it's like it's a placemat or a piece of paper on a tabletop and you can only move it in, um, in the, the red or the green direction, but not up or down. Unless of course you use your arrow keys, which we've talked about. So, you know, the red and the green lock, try that. You know, that's not very exciting. That's just locking in the green direction. But if you lock this to the blue direction by tapping the up or the down arrow key, Two interesting things are happening here. Two interesting and very important things. One is it's, it's auto folding. It's creating geometries necessary to allow this to be moved in the blue direction. So you can see at the corners, there's those four new lines. So go ahead and click once again to set that. 
Very important, this concept of auto-folding. You're essentially forcing SketchUp to move something and you're telling SketchUp, you know, I don't care what you gotta do, just move it in that direction and it will create the necessary geometries to allow for that. Now, if you grab the Move tool, you'll notice in your, in your lower left hand, so keep an eye down here, that'll change in a second, you'll see some different tool tips and modifiers and one of them is to create an auto-fold. On a Mac, it's Command. On Windows, I think it's Control, I'm not sure, but I tend to like to use the arrow keys instead of the modifier keys. They do the same thing. So, that being said, let's click once to start moving this top surface. And, you know, once again, you'll see that it's locked in the blue direction. Well, let's hit the left arrow key and see what happens. Now I'm moving it in the green direction, and you can see all those dashed lines where SketchUp is uh, creating the necessary geometries to allow for this move. So I'm going to go ahead and push that back a little bit and click to position. And if I wrote orbit, you can see that the shape I've created by invoking that auto fold command. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and delete these. And I'll draw a couple circles. Actually, I'll just start with one circle. And we'll, we'll talk just a little bit more of, with the uh, push-pull and the move tool. Let's grab the push-pull tool. So this time we will use one of the modifier keys. So the, the modifier key that we'll be using on the Mac is option on Windows. I think it's control. We won't use it quite yet because it, if you've only got one surface, it doesn't matter. So we'll go ahead and push-pull this up first. And, you know, I forgot to turn off my hidden geometry. We don't need that. So if I were to push-pull on this surface, it effectively moves that surface. Same with the Move tool. If I click on it and click to position, I'm just moving it. Back to the Push-Pull tool. Well, that option, that's a toggle. I think it's a toggle. Let's find out. Yes, it's a toggle, meaning you've only got to tap it. You don't need to press and hold. You just have to tap it. And you'll notice that your, your cursor changes. You've got a little plus symbol there now. And if I click once to start and click again to position, I've created a new face. So I've done two things. I've done a push-pull, but it's kept that original face. And you can do that in the you know additive direction. I'll hit the modifier key once more. And this time I'll go down. No, oh, never mind. I thought you could go in the down direction. You cannot. So let's try going up. There we go. So I've uh, um, effectively created two new faces um, and done the push-pull tool. And the reason I did this, because I'd like to talk about the Move tool a little bit more, and you may have accidentally found this out, but um, if you have, I'll explain what it is now. So once again, we've got this Active Select. The, the geometry that's highlighted before you click is the geometry you will move. So if I click on this middle one, you know, once again, I can see that I'm, I'm stuck to the blue direction. I can force it by hitting like the left arrow key. So now I'm forcing that to move in the green direction. You know, I can do it in the red direction, but I'm going to hit escape because I don't want to do any of those. Um, same with a, a, an edge. If you hover over an edge and you can see that it's highlighted, well, if you click, that's the geometry you will affect. Same conventions apply, but I don't want to do that. So I will go ahead and hit escape. And this time, very carefully, I'm going to move my cursor along this edge until it dis the highlighting disappears. Kind of neat, right? So, well, that's telling you something important. There's four of these on a circle. There's always at least one of them on an arc. And when the highlighting disappears right here, that's telling you that you are on a control point. And that control point, when you move it, will have a different effect. So we saw what happens when we move the edge Let's see what happens when we click and move on that control point. Well, we're changing the radius. Now, again, you can do that to arcs and circles. Pretty neat. I can find the control point for this one. And I can find the control point for that circle. So those are when you are on an edge. Well, if you move your cursor along a curved surface, again, only for arcs and circles, not for arbitrary curved surfaces, but you don't find a point, what you find is a control line. And same as before, you just keep moving until you find it. When you are on a control line, go ahead and click to start the move. And click to position. And to knowing and understanding the different input methods, knowing these little tricks of uh, control points and encouraging inference points can be really helpful 
and it'll definitely make your models more detailed as well as a lot easier to build.